The Yankees have given Anthony Volpe the keys to the shortstop position this season. But should they have? Could it be time to give Oswald Peraza a real chance in the majors? You are Locked On Yankees, your daily New York Yankees podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Yankees, which is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And thank you for making us your first listen every day. I'm Stacey Gotsoulias. This episode is sponsored by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On MLB for $20 off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. With me, as always, is my producer, Steve Granado. Steve, tell everyone what we got going on today. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome to the show again. Hey, the White Sox in town. We have a preview of that coming up later on in the show. Get your pitching matchups. And, of course, our favorite segment, Hot, Cold, and Heating Up, where we tell you everything you need to know getting ready for this upcoming three-gamer. You can listen to that whole thing, by the way, on SiriusXM, just like you can the entire Yankees season. First, Emily Messina is here with us here today, Stacy. Emily is the number two voice for the scranton wilkes Bay Rail Riders. Uh, a good friend of mine, and we have her on to chat a little bit about some options that the Yankees might have should Nestor go down, uh, or if anybody else goes down for that matter, what they could do pitching-wise. Uh, also talk a little bit about Matt Crook and how he's been working out of the bullpen. But first, of course, we have to talk about Oswald Peraza. Emily has watched him all season long, and we're going to ask her, should he be called up and given a chance maybe to play some short over Anthony Volpe? That's coming up right now. Take a listen. Emily Messina from the scranton wilkes Rail Riders joining us today. Emily, we want to talk about Oswald Peraza. You've obviously gotten a chance to watch him a ton this season. Just kind of break down a little bit of what you've seen. What has made him kind of stand out this season from your eyes? Well, first, thank you for having me. Huge fan of the show. Um, no, Peraza has been fantastic to watch this season. I've really gotten... Um, you know, a chance to get to know him a little bit on the field as a player and as a person. And he is a huge piece of Scranton Wilkes-Barre's lineup right now, batting always in the top of the order, starting shortstop position. And when you talk to him, he, I think a huge reason for his, his success is that he's just having a lot of fun out there. He's just enjoying being a part of the team. He's enjoying playing and it's leading to really good at bats and really good plays on the field. He had an excellent play that was actually SportsCenter top one, the number one play of the week, uh, the other week. And he, he said it was the best play of his life. So I think he's just having a really good time out there and um, it's making a difference in his play on the field. Obviously, I got a chance to watch him last season, too, in, in, in your shoes, weirdly enough. But um, I think the one thing that really stood out to me, at least from his swing, was how tight his hands were, how quick his hands were and how just everything was so robotic in a good way. Like it was like the cookie cutter, perfect swing. Has that been kind of, has there been any of an evolution of that or what have you seen from his swing this season? I would agree. It's very smooth. He's not pushing the swing, even when it's a tight situation, even when there's runners on the bases and out, you know, he's not one of those guys that corkscrews himself into the ground, trying to send it over the fence. He's got natural pop and natural speed that can turn, you know, a single into a double or even, a, you know, he's had triples in the past couple of games. So he is getting that power as well, but it's also sort of with ease and with a smooth swing. And I think you're right. A lot of that is with the bat speed as well. You mentioned earlier the uh, defense, and that was something I've talked about on a couple of occasions on this show. But I, again, I think you have seen the latest version and watching the latest and greatest Oswald Peraza defensively. I noticed just the instincts were there. He never seemed to be in the wrong place. He never seemed to be one step too far to the right or to the left or anything in, in that regard. What's his defense aside, you know, the highlight reels, but just on a day-to-day -day routine plays and, and just those instincts, where is he at with that right now? I think a lot of people talk about first step as an outfielder, but I think we should bring it up here for him as a shortstop. There's just so much ground to cover. And that first step is so important when a ball is in play and you're, pretty close to home plate being in the infield. He's got the right amount of range. He's got the speed to get over for balls. He's not afraid to dive and make that play back behind second to do that jump throw or do the, you know, off kilter throw and his willingness to go out there and make some big plays has led to 
some really big plays. He's got the range, he's got the speed, and he certainly has the arm. I want to ask you in a second whether you think he deserves the opportunity to get major league at bats on a consistent basis. But Stacy, we've talked a lot about Anthony Volpe this year, which is the obvious competition at that position, right? Because IKF is not playing short, uh, at least on a regular basis. It seems like he has lost that job, and it seems like you know externally he's okay with that, or at least accepted that. Stace, do you think the Volpe experiment, while there have been some flashes of goodness, um, is or isn't working? Ooh. Hmm. I think I think because of the flashes it is, but it's also not. But I feel like he has a long leash. Like I feel like he's gonna have a long leash because they basically told him when they said he made the team that they wanted him to develop up on the major league level. And the beauty of it for him is he's not hurting the team with his bad play. If it were a situation where they were expecting him to be the star and the team was floundering in the standings and he was playing the way he was playing, I think you could see him possibly go down, but I don't think that that's going to happen. If that weren't the case, Emily, because I, I, I tend to agree with Stacy that it seems like the leash is a lot longer on him as opposed to some other players like in Estevan Florial seems like there is no leash at yeah. all for him uh, when slash if he gets to the majors. Um, but for for you, do you see an Oswald Peraza who is ready for Major League Baseball? Yes. If there is a spot for him, I think he could definitely handle it up there. The plays that he makes are at the Major League level and he has that mindset, I think, that would help him be successful up there. I get I, I we talked about this before we started recording and, and and I think without an injury it doesn't seem like Peraza to the bigs is likely there's just right? no just there's no space yeah that's exactly yeah you took took it straight from my brain there there's just no space because you again we talked about IKF he's already in a revolving uh position and and Glaber and Donaldson are kind of semi battling for for play right now have you seen emily just on an aside have you has peraza played anything other than short this season yeah he's played second a handful of times and third just once um and he looked natural over there i talked to him about playing third base he just says you know the action happens a lot quicker over there than it does at short and he's willing to play any of those other infield positions yeah, because remember, Stace, like he was the third baseman when Donaldson went down originally. He was at least for a couple of games. I mean, I know, Stacey, you haven't watched Oswald play as much as, as Emily has, but do you think that could potentially be a fit? Let's say Donaldson does go down again. I think so, and I think he should. He has the experience. It wasn't a lot, but, you know, he was playing in the ALCS. He made some plays at short, and he didn't look overmatched defensively at all. He looked perfectly fine i mean for a young kid to be in that position in the alcs i was really impressed with him and i was surprised that the yankees didn't find a way to keep both of them in some way but they just can't they can't dump donaldson because of all that money i know we talked about hicks being dumped but donaldson it's a lot more money and, and they're just going to stick with him there but my dream would be a cabrera peraza volpe <laughs> threesome in the infield i think that would be fantastic for the Yankees fun for the fans to see those young kids play and you know defensively I think it'd be really good too yeah I think any combination of those three on the infield with Rizzo at first you you could you could do a lot worse <laughs> uh in Major League Baseball I think in in, a, in your dream scenario my alignment is Volpe at second Peraza at short and Cabrera at third I don't think Volpe is good no, I wouldn't say good enough and maybe there's not the right word I don't I don't like Volpe at third right um I I like Cabrera at third out of that trio I don't think any of them are true third basemen right but uh if I had to pick of those three again you could do it a, a lot worse <laughs> um Emily you've seen Oswaldo Cabrera for like 20 seconds uh this season he was down for like a split second but uh if you had to pick between those three is that your alignment or where would you go uh, at the major league level with that, that trio? I mean, I have, I don't even think I've seen Cabrera. I'm not even sure if he stepped off the plane. Um, <laughs> but I don't know where I would put him. Um, but I do think, you know, maybe is that something that can be rotated through and everybody gets some, 
time at, you know, the different bases, depending on who they're facing, who's um, up on the mound and kind of see how that shakes out there. I feel like Cabrera is the only one with the, he's probably has the most experience over at third and he's the most probably comfortable in moving around positions every day. Cause that's sort of how the Yankees have been utilizing him just as a utility player. So I, I do think that there's um, an option where they could all be up there, but I guess it's just about regular playing time and, and wanting to get those reps in right now, as opposed to um, having, you know, everyone rotate out on the bench. Cause I don't think they're going to put three rookies in the infield. Buying tickets to your favorite events shouldn't be stressful. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. Steve's been using it this season, and he loves it. So if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for you. They have killer deals on last-minute tickets and their best price guarantee, so you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for the fun you'll have. Game Time also has flash deals and last-minute tickets. It's easy to find and buy tickets for every kind of event in your area, and they even give you the images of your seats so you know what you'll be seeing. With their lowest price guarantee and even event cancellation protection, Game Time is the best place to buy tickets in just a matter of seconds. Two taps and you're set. Snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On MLB for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, that's code Locked On MLB for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. go ahead and switch gears uh just a little bit and i want to talk uh about matt crook so emily you and i have seen a different matt crook which is really really interesting to me so i watched him last season as a starter primarily he obviously had a couple of games where he piggybacked and he was kind of going through some lulls in may and into june a little bit too but then i also saw the matt crook as a starter who took a perfect game into the eighth inning like i, I saw some really really great flashes of him you've seen him exclusively out of the bullpen what's it been like seeing crookie coming jogging out of left field he's been pretty electric honestly out of the bullpen if you exclude his last appearance in this past series he had like a 104 era and like three times as many strikeouts as walks and he's really good with coming in situations where um there's already runners on the base pass maybe there's an out maybe there's just you know one not two and he is really calm. He's level-headed in those situations. And it's been working out for him out of the bullpen. They haven't tried to make him anything more than that at this point. Um, there is sort of a full starting rotation in Scranton Wilkesbury right now. And have you talked to him at all? Or has, has Adam talked to him at all about that uh, bullpen versus, versus starting? Yeah, I think for a lot of guys at that point, it's just sort of like finding a lane that will get you to the big leagues. So if being in the bullpen is going to be the way that he is able to contribute in New York, I think he's one of those guys that would slide into that role and has slid into that role without making a fuss about it and was kind of bummed that he didn't get to appear in a game when he was up in New York. But I do think that um, situation will happen again and he'll get in this summer. Yeah, I've been calling for Matt Crook all season, essentially, <laughs> on the show. A big Matt Crook fan. Uh, as far as some other guys that you've gotten a chance to see, you, you mentioned the rotation there, and one of the new kids on the block out there is Will Warren. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but he was in Somerset last season when you were with the Reading Fighting Phils, uh, also in A. Did you, A, get to see him there at all, um, but you kind of seen the Jekyll and Hyde now, of, of Will Warren. Uh, what are your impressions uh, of him so far? I think the craziest thing about his situation is that when he was in Somerset, especially even at the start of this year, did not give up a long ball in any of his starts, in any of his appearances, made the jump to AAA, and that's been almost all of the runs against him has been homers. And I don't know what the difference is there. I don't know if it's coming off a certain pitch of his, but I do think that he has something special if he can – settle down a little bit in AAA. We've seen pieces of it with the, his nasty slider. And, you know, he's he's got a pretty solid fastball for a guy that doesn't have a ton of minor league experience. So I think um, just getting those reps for him and hopefully settling down a little bit in AAA, he's certainly been a nice part of the rotation. 
And we haven't uh, gotten the news before us recording here today on what the status of Nestor Cortez's uh, MRI has revealed on his shoulder. Uh, Stacy and I are preparing for the worst at this point, <laughs> but some guys that, you know, we, we know the two names that are the 40 man guys that make the most sense with, with Johnny Brito, who's obviously been there uh, a lot this season, more, more in the big club than with you. Uh, Randy Vasquez has been more with you than the big club who, who made his major league debut not too long ago, but some other guys, let's say uh, it is, it is worst case scenario, 60 day and a 40 man spot opens up for the Yankees. Is there maybe a dark horse guy in that rotation that you could see potentially filling that? Maybe a Mitch Spence or a Sean Boyle or a Will Warren or a Tanner Tolley. Like who who would be your dark horse candidate in that uh, doomsday scenario? Yeah, if you're not going to go with one of the guys on the 40 man, then I would definitely say Tanner Tully. Um, a lefty, so that brings a nice mix to the Yankees starting rotation. And I've never seen somebody so calm on the mound. So, you know, down to earth about his star and – you know, just taking it as it goes and doing his responsibilities and not over overdoing his start. You know, he's not a high below guy, but he's got such good pinpoint location that he can induce a ground ball double play when you need it. He can get, you know, that big out with runners on. He looks great out of the stretch too. I've been really impressed with how he's doing with runners on and, and being able to get out of the innings with not a lot of damage. He's worked his way up to six innings that's been the deepest that he's gone this season but he hangs out in like the 80 pitch count and I think that um, he has the right mindset to go up there if they would need him but with two other starters on the 40 man I think that's kind of sitting in his way yeah I know that he's had a couple of really nice outings thanks to your emails uh, that I get every day Uh, but overall um, the rail riders obviously playing much better recently uh kind of start out slow maybe not too dissimilar than last season maybe not as bad as it was last season to start the year uh, but they're playing much better what has it been uh with Shelly Duncan in the club this year that's kind of turned that around and kind of got things moving in the right direction I think the entire team loves having Shelly Duncan as a manager you know a guy that was a former player especially in this system and at this ballpark can really relate to the players of kind of all different parts of their careers. He knows what it's been like to be in their shoes. And one thing that he emphasizes is communication a lot. And I know that a lot of managers talk about that, but a guy that's on the younger side and that has been in the shoes of his players, I think has done a really good job of just keeping everybody updated on what's going on with this, with the starting lineup, what's going on with the rotation, Um, you know what lanes are you being used in in the bullpen and I think um, that's helped from top to bottom the biggest thing that's impacting the rail riders success right now is homers they lead all of minor league baseball and home runs right now they had two games with six home runs in them as well they hit 51 home runs in the month of May so that's certainly accounting for a lot of the offensive production for Scranton Wilkesbury right now. Well, you can thank Estevan Florial for a couple of those homers and back to back to back days. And what was it, five bombs in, in five games or something? Yeah, to that uh, regard. now with a dozen. So, yeah, that helps. That definitely yeah. helps. Uh, Emily Messina, uh, always appreciate your candor and your honesty and uh, love your work. So, thank you so much for joining us here on Lockdown Yankees. Thanks for having me. Many thanks to Emily Messina for joining us today. Stacy, first time meeting Emily for you. I've known her for a couple of years now. Uh, she's a very talented broadcaster and obviously way better spoken than I am. But uh, she knows what she's talking about. She knows her stuff. I love it. You know me. I love seeing uh, women power, you know, and seeing more women doing this. And I think it's great. And I wish her all the best. And I hope that, you know, she keeps moving up and doing bigger and better things. Yeah, hopefully we get her back on the show here soon as well. Hey, uh, let us know in the comments section, right away, if you think the Yankees should call up Oswald Peraza, if they can. If there's an injury, is he the first guy to go to? Let us know how you feel about that. While you're in the comments section, of course, you can leave questions for our Fan Mail Friday episodes. We do our best to answer as many as humanly possible on our Friday show, so make sure to drop questions here on the YouTube side. You can catch the White Sox series on Sirius XM. Begins tonight, three-gamer in the Bronx. Of course, we're going to preview that when we come back. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. 
Therapy is all about deepening your self-awareness and understanding because sometimes we don't know what we want or why we react the way we do until we talk through things. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on that journey of self-discovery from wherever you are. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on MLB today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash locked on MLB. Back now on Locked On Yankees, Stacey News Series 3 Gamer with the Chicago White Sox as they come into town for the first time. Hot, cold, heating up. Everyone's favorite. <laughs> I think I'm just going to keep saying that until it actually becomes it. Becomes it, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Speaking into existence, right? Yeah. Um, you know the drill. We go through the Yankees and tell you how they're doing lately. It's all about what you've done for me lately. So, Stacey, who on the Yankees right now is hot? I'll say Jake Bowers simply because of Saturday's game alone, because oh, I mean, yeah. my goodness, <laughs> that I mean, was quite was, a game what? for him Two two hot, cold heating ups ago. He was cold, right? Yeah. Yeah, I know. Here we go. Here we go. Jake Good Bowers happy. time. <laughs> Bowers believer. Believe in Bowers. Bowers powers. <laughs> Bowers powers. Uh, yeah. Who is cold? Oh, DJ LeMayhew had a rough series in LA. He was one for eight because he only played in two out of the three games. But in those two games, he did have a triple, but he also struck out six times. So it's a rough go for DJ LeMayhew. His batting average is down to 239, which is very un-DJ LeMayhew-like. So I think he's a safe bet for saying he's cold. (laughs) Yeah, and especially with Donaldson now back probably going to get the majority of the playing time. At least that's what Aaron Boone was saying a couple of weeks ago before Donaldson was activated. Right. So I don't know. DJ is going to have to make do with the playing time that he gets Mm -hmm. and uh, hope that he can start to contribute a little bit. Otherwise he's going to be an odd man out here moving forward. Uh, Stacy, who is heating up? I'll say Clay Holmes. I'll say Clay Holmes. Um, He picked up the save on Saturday, the cold start, and then he picked up the win Sunday night against the Dodgers. And I'm less nervous when I watch him pitch, you know, because he's River Avenue Blues brought up a really funny point on Twitter about Clay Holmes that he's basically like Dellen Batances, where you watch him and you don't know where the ball's going to go. But when it does go where he wants it to go, he's really good. And that's kind of how Clay Holmes is with his sinker. So um, we had a good Clay Holmes and let's hope that he's just, you know, getting into it and picking things up. Why is my brain melting right now? The, the, the triple B's. It was oh, Tantis, Tantis, Ben Brack- Wellos. Brackman, Andrew Brackman. That's who it was. I couldn't remember the third one. <laughs> uh Maybe that's for a reason. (laughs) Hey, so the White Sox in town, Stace. What a weird club. What a weird. We could say that about a lot of baseball teams this season, but yes, they're a very strange club. (laughs) I'm not even just saying this season. Yeah. What a weird, like, couple of years it's been in the South Side. What's going on with the White Sox this year? I really, yeah, it's strange because last year, I. If it, right there last year they were predicting you know 92 93 they were predicting them to do well and they finished 81 and 81 this year you know they're in the infamous al central which their first place team is only a game better than the al east's last place team they're under 500 they're not doing well overall although they just swept the tigers i believe coming into this series so they're on an upswing coming into this series but yeah they're really inconsistent and you can say that about a lot of different teams this season because we keep saying it almost every time we record it's a weird season it really is and some of these teams are just so you look at the standings and you're like just how are these teams doing what they're doing yeah especially the white Sox, which by all accounts have so much talent on that team yeah uh we're not going to see Dylan cease in this series. And he's one of the curious cases this year. I, I still, I think Dylan cease is the most underrated pitcher in all of baseball. 
Yeah, that's um, why I was doing this. I was like, oh my God, thank yeah. God. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, no cease in the series. You'll see game one, Clark Schmidt versus Lucas Giolito. I mean, Lucas Giolito has also had a weird year. He's extremely talented. It's just a lot of these guys are super talented. It just has not been put together uh, for the White Sox this year. Clark Schmidt coming off a really good outing though. Yeah. Hey, my guy. <laughs> Your guy. All of a sudden he goes five and two thirds and Stacy's calling Clark Schmidt, her guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's <laughs> something. That's something. Uh, hey, game two, Wednesday night, Lance Lynn, America's ace, Lance Lynn, world baseball classic. Don't forget Lance Lynn was there. Uh, <laughs> Going against who? TBD. Who's going to go? It's TBD. TBD. <laughs> Hasn't given up TBD. a run all year. TBD is the most amazing pitcher. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's Nestor's spot. Again, by the time we recorded this, there's no update on Nestor. Um, it's Brito, right? I think so. I mean, I'm not going to bet my hair on it, but I'm willing to bet that it's probably him. Probably. Yeah. That's what I would go with. Yeah. Uh, Thursday, talking of... Uh, iffy guys uh this season mike clevenger getting the ball versus luis severino sevi coming off of a terrible outing Ooh, that was rough that was very rough um now cone explained on the broadcast that he thought maybe he's going through a bit of a dead arm thing because his everything was down his velocities were all down by at least a mile per hour not disturbingly but Severino said that his command was off and you could tell. So um, hopefully he gets his stuff together and feels better on Thursday. And then Clevenger, like the rest of his teammates, you know, Giolito's four and four, Lynn's four and six, he's three and three. It's, you know, the team is a few games under 500 and they're just really inconsistent. Yeah, it's, it's, it should be at least a two of three here for the Yankees. I think just this, it's kind of a wild card pitching situation because Schmidt, don't, you know, that's all I got to say <laughs> who Wednesday, probably burrito. And then Sevy coming off of that. Like, it's just, I mean, it, in theory, you just look at matchup to matchup. You're going, well, the Yankees should win two of three, if not sweep this series. Uh, but I, I don't know what you're getting out of pretty much any of the guys going slash not going that we know of. Like it's, it's really strange and for uh, both it, and for up. both teams too. Cause it's just yeah. like, <laughs> yeah, kind of a wild card i don't think yeah. the yankees lose this series but uh you know i've been wrong in the past and i'll be wrong again <laughs> we'll see uh, drop your series predictions in the comment section while you're down there you can leave questions for our fan mail segment on fridays of course that white Sox series is on sirius xm this week just like every game this season uh coming up on wednesday of course we are going to recap game number one and give you our thoughts on Clark Schmidt's latest venture this time against Chicago. But that's going to do it for today's episode of Locked on Yankees. I'm Steve Granato. And I'm Stacey Gotsoulias. We'll see you tomorrow. 